Welcome to these presentations from Family History Month 2023 in Wellington, brought to you by the combined Greater Wellington NZSG branches, Hutt Valley, Colburnie, Wairarua and Wellington. Hello, um, my name is Pat Liddell, I'm the convener of Pyrrhoa branch and it's our turn tonight to be your host. Thanks to everyone for coming out on this really awful night. First, so it's my pleasure to introduce Anne Ball and Kay Batchelor, two experienced, experienced genealogists who will explain some of the tools and techniques you can use to make the most of your DNA test. Their talk also covers many free resources to extend your family tree and perhaps break through your brick walls. Using DNA in the past several years, they have progressed their trees and understanding of their ancestry even further, and I'm sure they will assist you to do likewise tonight. Both presenters have been researching for over 40 years. Anne is convener of the English Interest Group, and Kay has compiled a family history titled From Sugar Baker to Farmer, following the German branch of her extended family to New Zealand via London. So what to do when you've done your DNA? Over to you, Kay and Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Tenakoto Kata. I'm Anne Wall. And I'm Kay Batchelor. Um, two years ago, we gave a talk on fa in Family History Month about beginning your DNA journey, um, covering what tests were available and the pros and cons of each test. This evening, we're back to take that a little bit further to talk about what to do once you've decided to get a test and it's on the way or you've just received it and what do you do next? So the topics we're going to cover tonight we're going to do a little bit of a recap about what DNA is, and if you're waiting to start, what you can do in the meantime. Then we'll cover some first steps. It's important to do a few things first before you dive into your results. Then we'll cover some of the tools available to you that you can use to help organize and make sense of your matches and your results. We'd also show you some free tools that you can use and some websites and webinars and blogs that you can turn to if you need some extra help. And we'll finish off with some tips on further research and some things to consider. Now tonight we're using examples from Ancestry and My Heritage because they have a number of DNA tools and they have the largest databases of tests and testers and family trees. Right. So what is DNA? Before we get started on our main talk, here's a quick refresher. There are three main types of DNA, Y DNA, which on the slide is to the right, which is your father's 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 line. And only males can do that test. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Is it the left side? It's the left side, sorry. <laughs> on the right, my husband will tell me I'm terrible with left and right. We'll tell you. Anyway, on the right, we have mitochondrial DNA, which is your mother's 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 mother's. Um, analyzing these two specific tests is more um, is more is a more specialized topic, possibly for another day. Only family tree DNA offer these tests, and the tests are really quite expensive. One of them is up to I think for a thousand dollars. Uh, yeah, so we're going to focus on autosomal DNA, which is the third of the three types. This allows us to look at the DNA for all of our ancestors, as well as the two outside ones. 
lines. Um, why DNA and mitochondrial DNA do go back further to maybe eight or nine generations. Mm -hmm. More than that? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, as far as mm. records go, but autosomal DNA is good for about the last 200 years, back four or five generations. And that's keeping me busy at the moment anyway. So as you can see from the slide, the amount of DNA you share, you get from each of your parents is approximately 50% and 25% for your grandparents and then going back and back and back smaller and smaller. But you don't get exactly 50% from each of your parents. You might get 51, 49, whereas your, one of your siblings may get a different selection. So it's worth, if you're going on down this journey and you have mysteries to solve, particularly it's worth test, asking them to test or asking cousins to test. And you never know, you could solve a mystery. So we're going to be using a technical term called a centimorgan. What do uh, genealogists look at when they're looking at DNA? Everyone has 23 chromosomes, but you don't notice, but you'll notice here that there's only 22 shown. The 23rd chromosome is the sex chromosome, the X and Y that designates what sex you are. This is really of no genealogical use. And um, certainly these two, well, I've, I've not seen a testing company that shows the 23rd chromosome. I might be wrong. The picture here shows someone who's got a lot, two people who've got a lot of chromosomes in common. The red, this is myself and my aunt, so we do. The red line is called a segment. And if you're quick, you'll be able to count that there's 48 segments there. Um, and the length of each segment is measured in centimorgans. The longer, the more centimorgans you share with someone, the more, the closer you are to be related. When we're talking about people having say 230 centimorgans, that's the total amount they share. This picture came from my heritage, who show you by chromosome which segments you share. Ancestry only tells you how much you share with someone and how many segments there are in total. Analyzing segments to identify our ancestors is again a much more advanced talk. Kay will mention something like, we'll describe this in a little bit more detail later on. But um, just that is a talk in its own. So if you if you've decided to get a test, but you haven't sent it off yet, or you're waiting for the results to come back, what do you do while you're waiting? Do genealogy. After all, DNA is relatively new, and most of us have been doing genealogy for decades. So um, Doing genealogy is a favorite saying of Diane Southard, who's an American genealogist. So if you don't have a tree, build one. Start with yourself, your parents, your grandparents. Don't forget about your uncles and aunts, your siblings, your cousins, your grandchildren. Build as far back as you can. Now, don't worry if you don't know the exact dates or the place names. Put in what you think is correct, you can always um, refine it later. Now you'll see on the slide that I've given an example of Jean Curry. She's my biggest brick wall. She married in, in Edinburgh. They came to New Zealand in, before the 1841 census. She married again and she died all before parents' names were recorded on certificates. And there's been nothing passed down about who she was, where she was born, who her parents were. 
So I don't know exactly when she was born, but she did give her age twice. And so it, she was born about 1814. So I put circa 1814 in my tree on my heritage. And I'm assuming she was born in Scotland. It's better to put a place than leave it blank. Because if somebody was sorting through their matches and they were looking for a curry born in Scotland, they might not find my match because if I didn't have a place name there. Um, now build your tree as far as you can and try and have deceased ancestors in it because living people will not be shown for privacy reasons. So if you have a tree with just yourself and your siblings and your parents, if you're lucky enough to have them still living, then nobody will see the names in your tree. And it's the names in your tree that other people will want to look at to see if there are common names. So now that we've finished our recap, what do you do when you first get your results? It's tempting to dive in straight away, but there are some things you need to do first to set yourself up for success. And at this stage, it might be a good idea to explore the site, um, Ancestry or MyHeritage, or if you choose to test with another company, explore what they have to offer. There'll be menus and options and help files. Although the temptation is to just go straight to your results, it could actually save you a lot of time if you just do some basic familiarity first. Right, so if you log in, you'll see a page like the one that's up on the screen and you sign into your account and click the DNA tab and select your results summary and your DNA homepage appears, and you'll see I've, I've circled the word settings. You need to go to your settings and set something up. And my heritage will do this for you, Ancestry doesn't. So in the settings page, you get your name, your date of birth, and there you see DNA and family tree linking. Now you have to actually link your DNA test to the tree that you put in Ancestry. Now you can only link one tree to a, only one tree can be linked to a test at a time. However, if you do decide to take this further and eventually get siblings and so forth to test, you can actually link their DNA tests to your tree. And there's some help files in Ancestry that will tell you how to do that. The other thing you need to make sure is that DNA matches is turned on. And this is what enables other people to see you in their match lists. Now, one of the first tools on that first page was ethnicity. Um, under DNA, your DNA story. Now, ethnicity is based on reference populations and it's usually updated annually. And the different companies use different samples of these reference populations to calculate your ethnicity. So if you end up doing a test with more than one company, you might find that you have slightly different or even completely different ethnicity results. So they're really only a guide. You should take ethnicity with a grain of salt. Now you'll see on the slide that Wales is ringed. Until this update, I had no Welsh ancestry. And I've managed to get back on most of my lines, the Jean Curry line is an exception, more than 200 years. I haven't found a trace of an ancestor born in Wales. So I'm keeping my eye on that little bit of Welshness. Don't get me wrong, I'd love to have Welsh ancestry, <laughs> although I can't sing with a dam. But, you know, we'll just have to wait and see at the next update if that stays there. So the next main part of um, ancestry are your DNA matches, which is where you probably want to dive in straight away. Now, a recent feature 
in ancestry, and it's still in beta, is DNA matches divided by parent. Ancestry will work out which of your matches belongs to parent one and which belongs to parent two. And then it's your job to figure out which of those is your father's lines and which is your mother's lines. And the labels, parent one and parent two, can be changed once you figure that out. And then your matches will update overnight or within a few days, and you'll find them assigned to maternal, paternal, both sides, or even unassigned. Now, you can see here's an example. It's a relative of mine who's um, deceased but I have actually blocked out a few names. Um, and I happen to know that the parent two in this case is her father's line and parent one is her mother's line. Um, both sides, you'll get matches possibly on both sides where you've got really close relatives that have tested, or you might find that unbeknownst to you back four or five generations, your mother and your father were actually related to one another. And ancestry will, un, will unassign, have matches unassigned when they can't really tell from the DNA and from people's trees which side they think this match is on. You may discover that later yourself as you analyze your matches. Yeah. My parents are related, were related to each other about four generations back. The third tool of the three on the front page that are highlighted on the Ancestry DNA homepage is called Through Lines. Gives you a list of your ancestors and how they might connect to your tree. If I link John Wilday, who's been circled, he's my three times great grandfather. If I click on that, it shows me that I have seven matches. Six of those matches are on my direct line via William, my great grand, two times great grandfather, and one much more distant via William's brother Richard. Even though that match is only nine centimorgans, and it's usually not worth looking at anything less than 20 centimorgans, so nine is very, very small. I know that this is correct because I've done a, some quite a lot of research on Richard's family tree. And although I don't know the person who's been covered up personally, I know the work that I've done so far that this is correct. So the fact that we share a little DNA proves that both our researches are correct. And that's great. That's one of the main reasons for doing DNA for me was to prove that my research was correct. Not all through lines though, hints that you get through through lines are correct. It will give you further down. It will give you hints as to who other people think your potential ancestors are. These are very exciting to look at, but you need to check them thoroughly before you add them to your tree. I've seen one particular branch on my uh, paternal grandfather's side appear and disappear quite frequently and the name keeps changing. So someone else is changing doing some research and keeps having a theory and changing the tree. So they do come and go. So here we go. When you do, when we are now going to let you look at your shared matches, these are my top five shared matches. At the top is my aunt, that I mentioned earlier. I want to start with the left hand side and Third one down, you can see a little note. It, you probably won't be able to read it, but it actually says Eric's son. And then further down, I've got common ancestors are Henry Wilday and Mary Daffern. They're notes I've added in from research. So it reminds me 
when I look at the front this page where I'm looking. Moving slightly further across, there's a little green dot on four of the pictures. If there was a photo, if any of these people had put a photo, that would then appear. But the little green dot means I've actually entered that person into my tree and I can connect this to my tree, to that person in my tree. Moving further across, we've got Aunt 806. 1865 centimorgans and maternal side. So that's my aunt. She is my mother's sister. She is my aunt and we share a hell of a lot. Um, but it tells you, this is where they say whether, whether ancestry is put paternal or maternal. You can see the middle one, Eric's son, again, I, assign that as a paternal side. Um, that's because you can see that because it's got an I with a circle around it. I actually did that. Ancestry did the other ones. Moving further across, we've got public linked trees. A number of people in, that's my tree on Ancestry. Common ancestor, my aunt is a common ancestor to me by my grandparents. And you can see that there are two that don't have any trees at all. They can never be identified as common ancestors because they haven't given any link, hint to ancestry, how they may be related to anyone. Um, oh yeah, I meant to mention the, the bottom one doesn't have a green blob. I do know how she, who she is, do know how she fits in, but I have yet to type her into my tree, so I can't connect her in yet. Um, and on the very far right, you can see they've all got yellow dots against them. I've set up my dots so that if it says yellow, that particular color yellow, I know who they are. You, Kay is going to explain how we use the dots further on. Yeah, it's me again. Okay, right. Well, the rest of this talk is really about how you organize your shared matches and helping you get the most out of them. So Anne has got over 15,000 matches, shared matches, and Anne's husband has got over 50,000. I've got 23,000 matches on Ancestry and nearly 19,000 on my heritage. And there are a few overlaps, but not that many. So we need a strategy to help us organize this amount of information. So as Anne said, make notes, um, use dots, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Ancestry, as we've seen, tries to work out which is your mother's side and which is your father's side, but my heritage doesn't do this. You start with your closest matches, always start with your closest matches. I, I roughly go by your top 20 matches and work on them first. Um, and Anne and I use the colored dots to identify main lines and then further back or for unknown groups of matches, but you can choose however you like to use the dots and you might want to have a play trying it out just on a few matches to start with. So here is an example of using the dots. This slide shows some of Anne's matches further down her match list. As she said, she's allocated yellow to indicate that she knows where this person fits into the tree. And she's allocated purple to indicate that she doesn't know where this person fits in yet. Anne's also allocated a color for each of her 16 second great grandparents. And you give somebody a dot by clicking on the little pencil like symbol and ticking the appropriate box. So it you, you kind of need to set these up in advance um, and sort out how you want to group your matches. Um, but you might 
just try it out with a few to start with, and then you can undo it, go back and start again. Um, once you, you've got these dots, you can use any combination of filter um, in your search parameters. So we'll see that example on the next slide. Um, here, Anne has selected the unidentified group with the purple dots and a location, England. And there are a couple of other people on this slide with other dots, other, other colored dots. These are because Anne thinks she knows where these people fit in, but she hasn't actually done the research yet to prove it. So as well as filtering matches, as well as searching for matches with a surname in the tree or a location, you can filter on matches that you haven't looked at yet. Um, you can filter on the common ancestors that you saw on the other page and is there on this slide as well, um, or any combination of the above. But the searching is only as good as what people put in their tree. And this is why I said at the beginning, even if you don't know where precisely someone was born, it's worthwhile putting in the country because otherwise, if these people hadn't had a country in their tree, they wouldn't have come up for Anne on this particular search. Now, over to you. So we've talked about common ancestors. And so this, if you click on a common ancestor, on a shared match, this is what comes up. This is uh, another way of looking at the through lines I talked about earlier. And it's the same example as I gave in through lines, John Wilde and the nine centimorgan match. This actually shows how Ancestry thinks I connect to that other person. As with all the trees on this site, we've said this before, you need to check the other person's research. You do get false positives, especially when you share small amounts of centimorgans with the other person. I know you know your date, your tree is correct, but you can't assume other people's tree, trees are correct. And as I mentioned before, common ancestors can disappear if you change your tree or other people change their tree. I recently found out that my four times great grandmother's name was Anne Harvey. And she married John Wilde's father. And as soon as I put Harvey, Anne Harvey in, some of them, some of the matches, common matches disappeared. The matches stayed the same, but the common ancestors disappeared and others popped up instead. And I found it very fruitful examining those other people's trees. Make a note before they disappear. You will never know when they disappear because it could be other people changing their trees, but make notes about your common ancestors. So now I want, so now I want to um, show you how I use genealogy and DNA to solve a mystery in my husband's family tree. His fifth highest match came up on Ancestry with 238 centimorgans. It was someone called Ben. I had never heard of him when he appeared in my husband's shared matches. When I looked at the matches they shared, I could see that it was on my husband's father's side. I contacted Ben and luckily he responded. We shared trees with each other, but neither of us could see anyone in common. He did give me a clue that his mother used to live in London, but hey, that's a really big clue. Big area to search. Then a while after that, he let me know that he just found out that the person that he thought was his father who brought him up for the last 60 years wasn't his father. While he was coping with that shock, I started doing some more research. 
So I knew I was looking for a male in my husband's tree and that it was quite close and that it was an unexpected parent situation, second or third cousin. Between them, they shared 11 matches. So I started doing the genealogy on the matches to see where each one fitted into my husband's tree. I couldn't find which line all of the matches were in, but I did find enough to solve the puzzle. I found that the majority of the shared matches were on the Mesa line, the top two up there, if you can't read it. But one was connected by the Nouch line, which is the bottom one. The middle one of the four is unknown, and I still don't know who they are. So that helped me focus in on where I needed to look in the tree. So knowing that they had to have Mesa and Nouch ancestry, narrowed it down to the great grandparents, which is about second cousin as well. I've circled Charlotte Jane Bone, daughter of Charlotte Anne Nouch, and Frederick Charles Messer, my husband's great grandparents. We did sort of entertain the fact that Frederick Charles Messer may have um, done something naughty with his mother in law, but we, did, we got rid of that. Um, the people who were descended from the two great grandparents were the only people who could have, once we got rid of that theory, were the only people who could have had um, both Nouch and Messer DNA. No one in the family knew of a third sibling to Hilda Jerry's, my husband's grandmother. And I did a very thorough search because that was theory number two um, to prove that we couldn't find any third sibling. Ben's father couldn't have been James Ball, my husband's grandfather, or Sydney, Edith's husband. Um, Frederick did get married twice. Frederick Thomas did get married twice. But because he had daughters, he that was out of, unless he, that was another theory we tried that Frederick, it was Frederick Thomas. However, Ben's age led me to look at the next generation. Another rather scare, scary theory was that it was my father-in-law or one of his brothers. But we discounted that because uh, they would have shared an awful lot more DNA if my husband had an unknown brother. And because we were looking for Ben's father, it couldn't have been any of the daughters on that line either. Then Ben told me that his mother, who he had no contact, has no contact with, lived in the same area and at the same, approximately the same time as the remaining candidate, Bill. And after discussing this a lot with uh, Ben, this is where we think he fits in. We can't prove it definitively until we find somebody from Edith or Sydney's line who is prepared to test, have their DNA tested, but we're pretty sure that this is where it is. Ben needs to, part, to look for a DNA match descended from Sydney's line, that's siblings or further back, or even his father if he's still alive. Um, Bill lived in Bexley, and Ben's mother lived in Bexley Heath. Somebody thought they were being very clever when they said Bill probably had a bike. <laughs> and it was very good to be able to solve this mystery. 
we're moving down to other mysteries as well, further down the track, but it was great to be able to sort, sort this one out. Right. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my heritage now. We've given ancestry a good go. So my heritage has similar tools to ancestry, but the slightly different terminology. So common ancestors and ancestry are the theory, theories of relativity in my heritage. Dots are labels. Hints from another person's tree are smart matches. So if you uh, have a, a set up an account on MyHeritage and uh, you, you have your test there, you've tested with them or you can transfer your ancestry test for free um, and click on DNA matches, you will see that it will tell you how many DNA matches you have. And you might not be able to read that, but it says I've got 18,908 DNA matches. And down the bottom of the page, you can actually choose how many of those matches to display at a time. You can either choose display 10, 25, or 50. Now, across on the right-hand side, there are filters. And if you click filters on, you see the line below where you've been told how many DNA matches you have. And there are your filters, like an ancestry, where you can sort by tree details, relationships, locations, ethnicities, etc. Now, the example I've got on the screen is I've clicked on tree details and I've sorted by has the match a theory of relativity. Now, my heritage is better than ancestry in this regard because it's telling me that I've got 85 DNA matches that have a corresponding theory of relativity. I wish Ancestry did that for common ancestors. Maybe they will in time. Okay. So when we look into the theory of relativity in my heritage or common ancestors and ancestry, my heritage uses my tree on the left hand side and my matches tree on the far right hand side. And it uses other people's trees in the middle to connect us. So if you look at the top of the screen, you can see I've ringed paths. Now there's often more than one way to connect people and their trees. And sometimes there are more than one set of ancestors that will connect. So in this example, there are three paths that my heritage has found to connect me and my match. Um, and I'm just showing you path two. Now, you'll see in the middle of the screen that there's a percentage ringed. Jane Marshall on the left-hand side, my heritage thinks is the same as Jane Menzies Marshall next to her. And they've put 100% against that. So they're 100% confident this is the same person. Further over, further down, you can see Lizzie officer matching Lizzie officer in another tree, they're not quite as confident about her because they've only said 85% certain that it's the same person. And then further down where we're getting to my match's mother, it's Vicky, they've gone down to 72% confident. Now looking at these percentages is quite important because you can accept, confirm a theory of relativity or you can reject it if you think it's wrong. Now, in this case, I had done the genealogy long before DNA on this family, and I knew that Elizabeth, Lizzie, and Vicky were in my tree. What I didn't know was the name of Vicky's child, and this gave me the name of Vicky's child. Now, this was a particularly, this was a cumbersome path with five, four trees in the mix. I actually confirmed the theory on path one. It only had three trees, mine, my matches, and one in the middle. Right. So as I said, sometimes the theory is incorrect and you have to verify it yourself. 
Of my 85 or so theory of relativity matches, there are about five of them that are flat out wrong. But 80 are right, so yay, I win. Okay. Uh, next tool is um, Centre Morgan Explainer. Now I'm going to use the same example that Anne used before with Ben. So here we've put Ben's shared Centre Morgans with Anne's husband, 238 Centre Morgan shared. And then we've put Ben's age, no, Anne's husband's age into the next box. And then we've put Ben's age into the next box and click submit. And it comes up with a list of possibilities for the relationship. And you'll see that it's assigned a 68% um, probability to Ben being a second cousin, which is great because Anne had worked that out laboriously using the genealogy. And this is a confirmation of that. So it's validation. But she still had to do the genealogy to be sure. Okay. Right. Well, I'm going to cover these next two very quickly because this is really advanced stuff. It's just an illustration of what you can get in my heritage. The chromosome browser is not for the novice, um, and I only use it a tiny bit. So my heritage gives you full chromosome details for your matches, which, which segments map you match people on which chromosome. Ancestry doesn't do this. Now, this is an example where the first match on the left is Sarah, and I share 20 centre Morgans with her. And I've put other of her matches into this browser to see if we share the same segments. Now, at the top right hand of the screen, there's a symbol called, it's called the triangulation symbol. Now, it, it means, if you see that symbol on one of your matches, it means that you and that person share a triangulated segment. Now, that's a segment that all of the shared DNA matches share with each other. And that makes it much more likely that this segment comes from a common ancestor. So in analyzing Sarah's DNA matches, there were about 20 that came up triangulated like this. You can see the outline around the segment of DNA. And I happen to know this is on my maternal side. And I could have, when I actually, um, yeah, there were about 20 and of them eight have trees. So what I'm going to do now is just knowing that we share the segment on chromosome three is not really any use to me, but eight of them that have trees, that's of use to me. So I'm going to see if I can build out their trees and find the common ancestor. I might or might not be successful. We'll have to wait and see. Okay. The last tool in my heritage is again, for the bit more advanced user, and it's called auto clusters. And basically it's my heritage trying to group your matches into groups that have a common ancestor. Now I found it of little use because, and it might be just the particular DNA and the particular people that have tested in my line, um, of my nearly 19,000 matches, there's only 106 in the shared clusters. And the vast majority of them are in that big pink square. Um, and I know exactly who they all are and the orange square and the yellow square. Uh, I know a few of them further down, but most of them near the bottom, they don't have trees. I don't have a clue which part of my family they fit into. Um, so, uh, of limited use to me, but your mileage may vary. Somebody else may get a lot of use out of this. So that's all I'm going to say on auto clusters. I will talk a little bit about manual clusters later, though. If you have a MyHeritage subscription, it's worth actually doing auto clusters and your DNA is in that as well. It's worth doing 
uh, the autoplaster because the way it generates them is very pretty. Oh yeah, it's fun to look at. Okay, so let, let's cover some of the free stuff. So most major libraries have an ancestry subscription that you can use, some with functionality restrictions. My ancestry and my heritage also will have free um, trials. You have to sign up for a trial and put a credit card in. So if you forget to cancel the trial, you'll still get billed. Every high day and holiday, there are specials. Father's Day, Mother's Day, Granddad's Day, Dog's Day, <laughs> Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, Black Friday, Christmas, New Year. There's always a special. So if you are thinking about getting another relative to do their DNA, wait for a special and don't pay the full price. Also, when we're talking about building trees to get more matches, to get more common ancestor matches or theory of relativity matches, building your tree back out and down, you might find on one line there's a mystery, like Anne did, there's a mystery to solve. See if you can find a cousin that might want to test on that line that you can perhaps offer to pay for the test or share the cost of the test. So take advantage of the specials. However, if you have an Ancestry Australia test and you ask your aunt in the UK to do a test, you get charged, and you think you do it, you're doing it because there's a special in Australia and New Zealand. You get charged the price that it is in the UK. Whereas it was 96 Australian dollars on special, it was 200 pounds in the UK. Mm, ouch. Okay, so where am I up to? Right. So things you can or can't do with a free stub. We're still trying to we're still still trying to save you money. Um, I'm privileged. I can afford to pay subscriptions. Not everybody can. I think this is correct in this table. I'm sure if it's not, somebody will let me know. So you can do a lot for free, but not everything. You've got to decide what is important to you. Subscriptions can range from a couple of hundred dollars to nearly $500 per year. Consumer Magazine has a good article online. Um, I accessed it no problem and I don't have a sub to consumer, so I guess it's free. And, and it, it tells you um, pros and cons of what all the different subscriptions are, what you get. And there's also a lot of advice like that online. Remember, if you've done your DNA test on Ancestry, you can transfer it for free to my heritage. That's if you win the raffle. <laughs> and you want to do it, get use my heritage. So before we talked about um, the CM explainer in my heritage this is a free tool which is in dna painter called cm tool and it does almost everything that cm explainer does and this one while a lot of the tools in dna painter you have to pay for this one is free so you can use this if you don't have a my heritage subscription this tool is based on data collected by Blaine Bettinger since 2015 for the Shared Centimorgan project. Blaine has been crowdsourcing data on a number of centimorgans of DNA shared for known relationships. The result is an incredibly useful data set of over 60,000 participants that helps genealogists start to figure out just how they might be related to an unknown match. And uh, we've done a handout of this. So if you've not got a piece of paper that looks like this one, they are out on the front desk by the exit to Aitken Street. And if you are online, 
just search for DNA painter and you will find a good explanation. So how do we use this tool? So again, using Ben's example, if I type in 238 centimorgans, it highlights which relationships it might possibly be. I can't type in Ben's age or my age or, or my husband's age, but by knowing approximately how old they both are, we can eliminate some of the ones at the top and some of the ones at the bottom. And it's really comforting to know that one of those is second cousin, a possibility is second cousin, just like in the My Heritage tool, and in as ancestry predicted, and as I found in the genealogy. If I click on that box that's, that's got a circle on it, it comes up with this histogram. And that shows me that second cousin is the most common, most likely relationship. And it's good to know that that responds with, corresponds with the genealogy as well. My husband does have a lot of DNA shared matches that go through his, was it your mother's, your mother's, oh, I know, I'm just trying to think, I shouldn't have done that, I should have written this down, your mother's half uncle, who is actually only a year older than his mother. And that would not be, a, that muddies the water quite a lot, and that would not be the most common relationship of the, of the, on the Centimorgan tour. Right, so even more free stuff. I talked before about auto clustering and said there was a manual way of doing this. It's called the Leeds method, and you can read about it for free at Dana Leeds' site. Um, you can download your match list from my heritage as a CSV file, and but unfortunately you can't do that with your ancestry matches. Um, and the idea is that you use a spreadsheet to group your matches, say with your great grandparents' lines. And this is what this square is illustrating, or rectangle actually, of um, matches that fit into one of those four lines. Um, I found it useful when I started to build my genetic tree before I knew lots of who my relatives were. Um, if only Ancestry would allow you to download all your matches into a spreadsheet, I think it would be even more useful. One can hope. So talking about useful DNA websites, I mean, we haven't covered many here. There's heaps. Um, first of all, going back to what I said near the beginning, is all the DNA companies have useful information on their sites. Of course, the New Zealand Society of Genealogy has an excellent site, though you do need to be a member to get the most out of it. We mentioned DNA Painter. There's lots that's free on it, but if you want to use some of the more advanced tools, it's about $75 a year. Lost Cousins is a great site, and you can do a masterclass there for free. Cindy's List. Cindy's been around forever, and there are thousands and thousands of articles there but when I looked at it recently I count I saw there were 655 articles on DNA and related topics and the Leeds method website as we just mentioned so as well as websites there's webinars uh, the NZSG have a great boot camp that you can go on for free once you've become a member. 
if you wanted to watch every single series of Who Do You Think You Are, UK and US, if you have a free weekend, um, you can on YouTube. Some of them have information about DNA in it. Can I, can, can I put a plug in here for the best one that I ever saw to date? It was um, Judy Dench. It was absolutely amazing. Nothing to do with DNA, but Stephen Fry's made me cry. <laughs> anyway, um, legacy. Family Tree have a lot of webinars. There's 260 on DNA at the moment. Uh, that costs $80 New Zealand for a year, but if you're going to sign up and watch more, then that might be worth it. Roots Tech is run by Family Search. That's free, but you do need to register. And we mentioned Diane Southard earlier on. She's got some excellent stuff as well. But wait, there's more. Um, most of these are free. And for the people in the room, there's another handout that um, I've written these up on. Two to mention are Louise Coakley, Jeannie Wan. She's an Australian genealogist. And Michelle Patient is also Australian, but she lives in New Zealand. And of course, there's Facebook. And really, we need to give a plug for the branches, don't we? The four branches in Wellington, NZSG, uh, they all have people who know about DNA. Some know more than we do. Some know a lot more than we do. And NZSG is in the process of setting up a DNA on an online DNA interest group. I don't know anything more about it, but it's going to be there soon. Um, and I'll just mention, um, because I should have put this in the talk, there's a, I'm not much a user of Facebook, but there is a good Facebook group that I do actually belong to using DNA for Genealogy Australia and New Zealand. And that's really worth a look. Right, oh, it's me again. Gosh, time's flown. So we're up to the, nearly at the end. We've got some tips. So some of these we've already covered, but it's worth um, repeating. So we talked about autosomal DNA right at the beginning. And that's, if you think of it, count 200 years back from when you were born, that's roughly autosomal DNA. You won't get matches on every ancestor from 200 years ago because DNA mixes at each generation and you lose some DNA as you come down to the present. However, sorry, as you go back to the past, you lose DNA. But if you test an old, a person in an older generation, that extends that back by, that, by the difference in your age. So it will give you a little bit extra to work with. If you have a line that is difficult to research or you've got a mystery, really the whole point is to solve mysteries. See if you can find somebody from that line and ask them to test. Contact people. Be prepared to send out 10 emails at a time. You'll probably get five responses. Two years later, you might get another one. I've been very lucky. I've had many more responses than silence. And every time it's helped me. Sometimes it's helped me negatively in that, no, I don't want to, I, no, thank you for contacting me, but I don't want to do anything about this at this time. But that's it, okay. Everybody is free to say yes or no. Use other people's trees very, very carefully. Always check their work. In my case, if I'm unsure about something, I put a two check. I might add a person, but I put a two check in the suffix field so I can go back there and just do a little bit more. Keep doing the paper research. Every year, more and more records become available. Remember that we've been doing this paper research for yonks and DNA is new. DNA is not a shortcut to doing your family tree. 
but it can verify your family tree or not, as the case may be for these unexpected pesky non-parental events. Used properly, it will expand your family tree. Build out and down, as I mentioned, um, read blogs, watch webinars, ask for help. And it's also useful to have a specific goal, e.g. I want to find out if great aunt Edith really did run off with that sailor and have children by him in Costa Rica. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe. <laughs> so the penultimate slide, you might find unexpected results. It could be your grandfather or your grandmother might not be who you expect. Or in Ben's case, it was his father. It might be further back. Everybody, not everybody is legitimate. And once you delve into your family tree, you've got to be prepared for that sort of thing. DNA is the science that proves that those two people weren't related. Be careful how you ask people to test. You might be excited by this challenge. They may not feel the same. They may not want to know, but respect their um, decision if they don't want to test. It's not worth, as I wrote there, it's not worth losing a cousin over. So finally, here's two cartoons. We showed the one on the left at our last talk, but it's, we couldn't leave it out. And the one on the right is a Gary Larson one. And apparently, Uncle Andy has a tail. And a great Uncle Bob was sucked into a tar pit, if you can't read those. Uh, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Any, que any questions? Yes. Um, hang on, there might be, a, is there a roving mic? We did at the last one. We don't at the moment. Just coming. So if you could wait till the mic gets to you, then everybody else will be able to hear. Thanks, <laughs> Hi. Um, I've just done it well. I've done my DNA about six months ago, um, I've got a Chinese great grandfather, but it's not showing up in my DNA that I've got any Chinese in there. Why is that? Mm. Mm. Reference population, maybe? The reference populations are very good for America and Europe and not so good for other areas. Um, they are getting better. But can you ask someone else to test who is related from the to this Chinese grandfather? Yeah, one of my cousins. Um, he's got some of them. Okay. But so remember, I said that you lose DNA. Yeah. So I have a um, half sister and she's got DNA to matches that I have no DNA match to. So this is far enough back that the Chinese DNA that was handed down to the other person that's tested on this line didn't make it into you. I've got a lot of Scottish ancestry that I know of um, and on my ethnicity match I was surprised to find that like a 2% uh, Norwegian and I wasn't aware I had any Norwegian ancestors. Is that just because of the Viking connection or is it something else? 
I was just about to say Vikings, it's quite possible. Um, that would go back, uh, how, how many hundreds of years would that go back? Um, a thousand? <laughs> so, yeah, that's I'll, a way, way back. I'll just jump in here. Um, we're all human beings and we all share DNA, incredibly large amounts of DNA. The differences between us are trivial. Um, back uh, about, I think it's about the 11th century, the number, if we all had completely unique ancestors back about the 11th century, there would be more people on earth than there are today. And that's not the case. Everybody intermarried and intermingled. Your tree is more like a mesh. Everybody in this room is related to everybody else in this room. That's a statistical certainty. So the Vikings injecting their DNA into the gene pool in England in about 700 AD or rough 800 AD still um, leaves its trace today. Um, Norwegian, Scandinavian, Scottish, um, Orkney Islands, Shetland Islands, the north of Scotland, there was a lot of intermingling. And one of the other DNA companies says that I've got 3% Orkney Islands ancestry. Didn't realize that. And I've solved that mystery. So that might be a talk another day. So it could come from that as well. Northern Scotland mm. have ties to Scandinavia. It, 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 um, my Scottish ancestor, my great grandmother, was from the north of Scotland. Mm. That that makes it, it be a, yeah. a real possibility. However, my ancestry say that my dad has twenty. I have twenty percent Scottish ancestry from my father. I don't, I, I have no, nothing I can find that says that. However, we came from the Midlands and um, that's about as far south as the Vikings got. So I would not be surprised if that's where it's come from, but it's still something to look for. Okay, no more questions. Oh, we've got one up there. One up there. One more question. Don I didn't hear with the laptop. Um, if you load both your heritage, my heritage and your ancestry DNA into ancestry, is there any significant difference in the results? So you, you, you can take your ancestry test and transfer it to my heritage, but you can't do it the other way around. Ancestry won't accept tests from other companies. So are you asking if you load your ancestry test into my heritage, is that different from getting a my heritage test? No, oh, if you have both in my heritage and you run them, is there any significant difference in the results? I don't know. Uh, oh no, I haven't done a, a DNA test with my heritage. I've I've done a separate test with ancestry and a separate test with my heritage. I haven't transferred my ancestry to my heritage, so I can't answer that. I'm sorry. It is interesting, though, that um, a lot of Jewish people are now testing on my heritage. Where it's an Israeli, it's, it's parent company is an Israeli company. Um, and a lot of people from Europe are more likely to test on my heritage than they are an ancestry. So, uh, again, it, who do you want to find? You don't know where they're testing. I, I, I was advising a friend at Christmas and um, his cousin said that he'd done a test. He thought it was on Ancestry. In fact, he was pretty sure he was on Ancestry. So my friend did his DNA test on Ancestry. And when his result came back, we couldn't find the cousin. 
But then they got in touch with the cousin's son who clicked the right button and the cousin turned up. Well, I think we're running out of time now. So I'd like to thank both Anne and Kay for their interesting uh, pre presentation tonight. Um, my question is, should I have my ancestry tree public? Yes, because at the moment it's not, and because I don't want people stealing my photos, but I think I'll have to change it. We've had our DNA done, but yeah. So yes, yes, mate. If you want a private tree, unlink your DNA and create a public tree and link your DNA to the public tree if you want to protect your photos. And take the photos off. No, no, you can oh. you can leave your photos, you can leave your photos on your private tree, but create a public tree and link your DNA to the public tree. So you transfer all your dead com over. No? Well, yeah. I might need to go to your school and learn a bit more. Cousin, <laughs> we'll we'll chat. <laughs> right, thank you. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was our pleasure. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to find out more information about the New Zealand Society of Genealogists or our many branches around the country, please see our website www.genealogy.org.nz